Thanks so much. Welcome to the Halftime Report. I'm Scott Wapner, front and center this hour. The backup in rates, the sell-off in stocks, tough day shaping up for the major averages as we welcome in the investment committee today. Josh Brown, Bryn Talkington, Surat Sethi, and Jim Labenthal. They're all with me for the hour as we check the markets here. We've got a near 500-point decline for the Dow. S&P off by 1%. NASDAQ about one and a third. You heard Carl talk about the uh, Russell down about 2%. Uh, yields are up. The 10-year is. Crude's up. Dollar index is up as well. You know, Josh, uh, Chris Verone from Strategus today, the title of his note is Raising Our Guard. He says the push in yields right back to the key 435 level is important enough to lead with this morning. Coupled with the bid to the dollar, the strength in oil, the persistence from gold, we're inclined to tactically raise our guard here, particularly given a complacent sentiment backdrop. You agree with that? I do. You know, last week, uh, had, last week, there had been some really classic indicators that the market was in, in need of a little bit of a cooling off. When you saw that activity happening with the Donald Trump's back, uh, you just knew that there were games being played that we really haven't seen since, like, late 2021. You also saw a whole bunch of meme coins and I don't mean accidental meme coins, like they just became meme coins, but things that were deliberately created to troll everyone. You saw some of those start to add billions of dollars in quote unquote market cap. These are the types of things that typically happen toward the end of a really big run. Doesn't mean the final run, but they are toppy uh, in, in the aggregate. When you see like 15 or 20 of these things happening all at once, uh, I also noticed, like, and, and there's no, uh, this is pretty informal, and there's no real, um, you know, data that we could attach to this, but I also noticed some of the worst people on social media beating their chests again about Bitcoin and this and that. So that was, like, kind of a moment where you say, all right, well, let me look at RSIs. Let me look at how overbought the market really is. Let me add some data to this conversation. And sure enough, across the board, you just found like this incredible 90% of the S&P 500, uh, you know, in an uptrend. And you just say like, all right, things need to cool off. That's all this is, though, Judge. I don't think it's more than that. Uh, I could be wrong and things could change. But the way I see it, this is perfectly normal activity to expect in, a, in an otherwise raging bull market. I mean, Surratt bespoke today says the S&P, perfectly to Josh's point, the S&P 500 has closed in overbought territory for 50 consecutive trading days. The last time it's done that was more than 25 years ago in, in April of 98. So we knew that the market was overbought. You knew that, you know, there were a few tipping point possibilities, be it the backup in rates. Now you got oil up, gold up, dollar up. You know, and the, the question is, how much on guard do you think we need to be? Well, I think it's natural, to Josh's point there, we need to digest this huge run that we've had, really, in the last six months. But the, night, the, the thing that I like about this rally is that it has broadened. And, and if you had exposure to commodities, you had exposure to materials, you're doing well in this market. You're not just in this narrow four stocks now that are only doing well. So, And we've had some of the other ones, that, with the winners come off. So I, I do think it's, it's natural for the market to come back. And if rates are doing this and the market is strong because of the economy, that means earnings should be good, which is good for the stock market. So these are things that are happening for the right reasons. I'm not as worried as if they were happening for the other reasons, which is, mm -hmm. hey, a slowing economy, and now we're, we're going down to shoot. Sure, but you, you could say, well, the market's broadened. That's a good thing but you could also probably make the case that overbought conditions have broadened you know what i'm saying because a lot of uh outside of of large cap tech has hit new record highs or new 52 week highs so there's a lot of boats that have risen with this tide and you can maybe point to some and say you know maybe that was a little much well i think that the the run in some of these other sectors has been really quick but those are the ones, at least for us, that's what we want to be in. So, yeah, we get a pullback. We can add more money there, but it's okay. I, I'm not as worried for the for the pullback. All right. Let's go to Steve Leishman. He has some breaking news now. The Cleveland Fed president, Loretta Mester, is speaking. What do we know? Uh, Loretta Mester, the Cleveland Fed president, as you say, Scott, it says it's appropriate to cut rates later this year if the economy evolves as she expects. She says there has been substantial progress on inflation, and she expects that progress to continue 
In fact, adding the inflation picture in her mind hasn't really changed much despite those recent firmer readings we got in January and February. She does it or had expected inflation progress to slow, so what she saw the last two months was very much in line with what she expected. The most likely scenario, she says, inflation continues to decline towards the 2% target over time. Now, she's not quite ready to cut just yet, saying she needs to see more monthly readings on inflation, quote, to raise my confidence, um, does not expect to have enough by the next meeting, enough confidence, that is, or enough data. Um, now, she does say the risks are coming back into better balance, but points out that the bigger risk right now is cutting too early. If inflation, she says, expectations come down, not cutting would amount to a tightening. So that's a bit on the dovish side. She does see higher inflation this year than the median Fed forecast out there, which is 2.6%. And she acknowledges that her neutral rate is at 3% compared to the median at 2.5%. I will point out for your uh, edification there that there are now seven members of the FOMC who are at 3% or higher for the neutral rate, and that compares to four back in December. She says the risks include heightened geopolitical tensions, um, slowing growth in the Chinese economy, and, of course, on the other side, stronger than expected <clears throat> productivity growth. Real quick look at the probabilities. Uh, they had been at 59% for June. Um, I'll just double-check that that is, remains the case after Mester talks. Yeah, that's just about where it is. You can see that uh, June's a bit in play right now compared to how it was, and then you look also at the uh, Fed funds for uh, the year end. It's 466. So right in line, even a little bit more hawkish than the Fed is tomorrow. Scott, I get to talk to Raphael Bostic, the Atlanta Fed president. You, you feel like, though, Steve, before I let you go, that the, the bar is increasingly growing higher for June? Yes, <clears throat> I think that's right. I think that it's, it, it is higher. My real concern right now is whether or not, given what y'all have been talking about, the higher commodity prices, higher oil prices, um, whether or not that feeds into two things. One is inflation expectations, and the other is the March inflation data that we get in April that's going to maybe set the count back again. Everybody keeps saying, well, Waller said a couple months. Uh, Mester says she needs uh, some, a few more months of data. That, you know, if you get that, that, that constant data that doesn't show the improvement, we got to start counting again. So that's why June would be in play or not, or not necessarily a slam dunk for that rate cut, because I don't expect or I'm not confident we're going to get more progress in March. Steve, I appreciate it as always. Steve Leesman, our senior economic sure. supporter. Jim, I keep hearing, oh, we don't need rate cuts. Economy's great. That trumps, you know, rate cuts. J.P. Morgan today, their trading desk says the bull market can continue without them. Wolf Research, good chance of zero rate cuts. What about that notion? Whether we need them or we don't, yeah. you know, the market talked itself into a pretty dovish and happy place thinking that, oh, hey, the economy's great. So what if now seven has gone to three and now maybe three is going to go to two or maybe two goes to zero? We don't need rate cuts. That's my position. I'm not counting on it. And I'm not being blasé either. Um, you know, look, this is about a strong economy. This is about profits, which Sarah So you're in the camp about. that I was just talking about. I, that's, that's why I answered the way I did. I was expecting a little guffaw, but I didn't get one. I'm hurt. <laughs> um, no, I, look, this economy is very strong. And the sine qua non is that people are employed. When they're employed, they consume. Whether it's buying houses, which are showing green shoots, whether it's the manufacturing ISM that's indicating that inventories are being restocked because people are buying things, whether it's people traveling airline traffic is still very very high all right people are employed and for all of the worry that the long and lagged effects of uh, 550 whatever it is basis points of rate hikes by the fed would knock that down we're now two years past the initial rate hike if those long and lagged effects were going to uh, happen they would have started to happen by now they're not they're just not. What, you, what is happening, though, is the markets overall are coming to grips with the fact that a recession is not likely, could happen, not likely. And if it doesn't happen, then all these cyclical and value companies are likely to continue their good profit streaks and continue to catch up to the tech darlings. Now, could we have a pullback? Of course we could have a pullback. We're due for one. It would be healthy to have one. Scott, and dear viewers, I'd be surprised if you get more than 7%. I think 5% down, you're going to see the fear of missing out come in, and people are going to start buying because a lot of people have sat on the sidelines as this market has taken off. How much of this rally from the October lows has to do with expectations of rate cuts? And now you're going to tell me that we don't need any, and if we don't get any, that everything's going to be 
just fine. You're telling me that, why do you think the small caps are down 2% today? Why? Because rates are up. Trades that were working or theoretically were going to work mm -hmm. because of the prospect of rate cuts, you can't now tell me, that well, they're still going to work even if we don't get any rate cuts. Well, no thesis is per perfect, right? So you point out the small caps, and that's very hard for me to answer, but I think there's obviously a larger universe above small caps. If you look at the S&P 500, just a general barometer of the stock market, what's it off? One and a half percent from its recent high. And as Scott, you're pointing out, you know, we started the year expecting not me, not Surratt, not Josh and Bryn, but the market was expecting six rate cuts. Now we're down to maybe two or three. I mean, June looks like it's getting pushed out. This market is accepting it. This market understands it's not about rate cuts. It's about employment. It's about profits. It's about a strong economy, all of which you have. Bryn? Josh, I mean, Jim says, you know, rates are up in the market. He used the words, the market is accepting it. I would suggest the jury is still out. I mean, we're in the midst of a backup in rates. If you start getting above 4.4, right, we hit that, and then you start moving closer to 450 once again, that may be tested. You know what's so funny about that, Judge? I'm old enough to remember when 3% was the level we couldn't get above in the 10 year. That was like a no-go zone for stocks. And then we added 5,000 Dow points um, immediately after crossing through it. So yeah, I'm sure there's a trigger somewhere out there where people say, oh, you know what, actually, I'm gonna make a huge allocation shift uh, I don't know if it's 450. So I, I wouldn't get caught up in that conversation because if we go back and play the tapes, um, that's that's really not been incredibly helpful. It's not for the number. To make it's not decisions. necessarily to. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll grant you that. I guess my point is it's not necessarily a number. Dow down 501 points as I, as I ask you this question. It's the idea that rates are not going to do what we once thought they were going to do. And. Part of this move in the market was predicated on the fact that rates were going to do what we thought they were going to do, and that's go lower. So but at some why? point, you're, you're going to have an issue. What's that? But why? So, like, rates are not going to do what people thought they were going to do, but why? If the reason why is because we're seeing, like, re-accelerating inflation and some sort of an emergency where the Fed has to pivot, that's really bad. I don't think that that's currently what's being repriced right now. If the reason why we're not getting six rate cuts or four or three this year, or that it's not June, it's July, is because the data continues to be strong, I think, to Jim's point, he used the word I wouldn't have chosen. He said the market's accepting it. But to Jim's point, I would say the market can tolerate it. And that's a really big difference. So I come back to what I said originally. I think we were way overbought, not like in my gut feeling, but the data, RSIs had been explosive and the percentage of stocks in uptrends had been explosive. Like statistically, all this is, is a cooling off. And again, the reason why is not runaway inflation. The reason why is because there's no reason to think the Fed feels that they're in a rush to, to do any cuts. And we can tolerate that. So Jim said accept it. I say tolerate. There's a slightly uh, nuanced take there. But well, let, that's really all I see that's happening. If, let's also see, Surat, what happens with earnings. I mean, well, maybe more important in the, in the immediate term than whatever the Fed is going to do. Here we are debating whether they move for the very first time in June or that gets pushed off. Well, you're going to get a lot of earnings results before June. We are. Okay? And, Starting in the next week or so. And preseason, you know, earnings pre-announcement season is starting. So that'll be very interesting to see what the market does. And if the market can bear that earnings are stronger and, and are actually meeting expectations not beating it, I think you could have a stronger market. But, Scott, to your point, if rates move too fast too quickly, the market's not going to like that. And you, it doesn't mm -hmm. matter that you're going to get investors who don't like it. You're going to get algorithms that don't like it. And you're going to get funds that are going to move out of it. So you will get a lot more volatility in the market. And I think investors should be prepared for that. Does it, the question, though, Jim, is, is where you want to be invested in this new quarter. You've got earnings to worry about. Now you've got the possibility of rates starting to back up. You have certainly the possibility of at least commodity inflation becoming more prevalent and more talked about. Here we're having a conversation about, you know, President Biden and President Xi have a phone call. The Treasury Secretary is making a trip to Beijing starting this week, and who knows what developments are going to come out of that at a time where we've been nothing but worried about growth out of China. Well, maybe things are starting to pick up there, too. That's not inflationary, potentially? 
I mean, yes. I'm, I'm, you see me smiling for the first time on this show. CVS and United Healthcare have me in a bad mood, Scott. I know we're going to talk about that later, but if you're just wondering why I'm in a bad mood, that's it. But you brought, thank you for putting me in a good mood. You brought up China, that manufacturing survey over the weekend that came in better than expected, and our wind resorts is popping on it. I, and that's, a, I know that's specific, but the point I'm trying to make is, and Josh was just making mm -hmm. this. There are good things that come out of this as well. I understand that the world is looking for job uh, creation not to be as great on Friday so that maybe the Fed will cut rates. I'm saying it's good if you get better than expected jobs numbers. And that's also inflationary. I'm saying it's good if commodity demand is going up because China is recovering, if possibly there are green shoots in, in Europe, possibly, very possibly, that this is good overall. Um, now, of course, nothing's perfect. I said that earlier. Yes, if inflation gets out of hand, then the Fed is going to have to start raising again. I think a question you haven't asked, which I ask myself in the morning, what am I scared of? Here's what I'm scared of. I'm scared that this does get out of hand and the Fed raises rates. We're not talking about that. That's not on the Fed's radar screen right now. Let's hope it stays off the radar screen because then you got to worry about what happens with the regional banks and does that become systemic right now? Don't have to worry well, about for, that. For, but that's forget, what we're scared Forget of. about the Fed raising rates. What if they just, the, what, what if the Fed does nothing for a while, longer than we thought again? And rates stay elevated where so, they are. Forget about the idea I, I of, of hiking you. rates. So, you know, when Josh said a minute ago that he remembered, and I was wondering what he was going to say, what I thought he was going to say is I remember the late 90s when the 10-year averaged about 5.5%, and the Fed funds rate was between 4 and 6%. And, man, I'll tell you, the late 90s, there were five years in a row. School. What's that? Well, you were an investor in high, in high school. school. I'm sure of that. You were an investor in high school. That I'm sure of. Uh, but there were five years in a row of 20% plus gains in the S&P 500. So the level doesn't, the level we're at doesn't freak me out. Changes in direction, like if the Fed changed direction, that would freak me out. Yeah, but you, 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 Judge. Talk, you talk as though we've, we were at zero. Mm -hmm. So we've gone from zero to 5% in a reasonably rapid period of time. You'd agree, right? And I got I got beaten to smithereens on that. Well, yes, a lot I of people agree. did because the market went down a lot. Yeah, exactly. When that happened. Exactly. Now we're mm -hmm. sort of banking on the idea that rates are going to start coming down from those peak levels. Now, they've obviously come down from the peak level, mm -hmm. but the idea that they're going to come down further has fueled this mm -hmm. rally in certain stocks and sectors. It, I remember about four months ago saying to you a couple of times on the show that I'd be scared if the 10-year went below 4%. It was on its way down from 5%. I said I'd be scared because that would indicate slow growth or, or declining growth. Um, you know, I actually did get scared. We went down to 3.9%. 4.35%. I read Chris Verone every day. He's spectacular, okay? But it's not freaking me out. Maybe I'm wrong. It's the, just not freaking the, me the out. The thing to, to add is, look, if, if rates do stay where they are and the economy slows, the stagflation is worse. So that is something that also keeps me up at night, that if we get that, that is bad for the markets and it's bad for the economy. You know so, what one of the issues is, too? You guys, I have nothing on my list. I have, like, I don't know, 20 pages of notes to work in today, today's show, not one of which is about new buys from anybody on the committee. There are a lot of people who are all in in, in this market, right? Jimmy all in, I used to joke no, about no, no, that. No, no, but you know I raised but, some cash. I understand that. that, but there are a lot of people who have now bought into the bullish story, right? There aren't that many bears left. Mm -hmm. So, you know, maybe this, if it develops into some level of a, a shakeout, is not necessarily a bad thing either. There are a lot of people on one side of the boat suddenly in this market. Don't you get that feeling? Yeah, and mm -hmm. I think people have either they're invested in their equities, they've got exposure to the markets, and they're sitting also in 5% cash. So there will be something on the side that you can put to work if you get a good pullback. That's a throw shit. All right, welcome back. Let's hit some committee stocks on the move. We're starting right there. Tesla down 5% today. Been a tough start to the year. This after deliveries uh, fell short of expectations. All right, Bryn. Um, Dan Ives was pretty explicit today. I know he's still a longer-term bull on the stock. He called it a train wreck, among other things. How would you assess this? Well, yeah, I mean, they sell expensive products. And that, I think even the bearish of estimates weren't thinking they were going to come out at, what, 387,000 vehicles. Listen, the way I look at it is this. In 2020, when they started the Gigafactory in Shanghai, that was a watershed moment. They were able to autonomously manufacture in the biggest EV market in the world, and that has helped grow their earnings and revenues and cash flow the last four years. What's happened, though? The Chinese competitors have copied them and have caught up. And so now it's somewhat, not existential, but it's like, how are they going to compete now in this very competitive market? And so I think that there's nothing to be excited about 
over the next two quarters because this company is way too big as a market cap and way too mature for new investors or existing investors to add to the position when we know their earnings come out in April, I mean, April 17th, I think they're going to have a bad Q2. And so we're just going to have to settle in here. But there's nothing to get excited about right now. And I think this is a good reminder, you know, don't fall in love with stocks because they'll break your heart. You buy more if the stock continues to slide. I said it's having a terrible start to the year. Yeah. It's down more than 30 percent. You know, you know, I like to sell calls. So half my position got called away at 220, which was, you know, it went much higher than that. So that, that's my discipline. I'm going to see if it settles in here at 160. What I think I'm going to do is wait till after earnings, let the analysts bring their numbers down. But really, I want to see a, an innovation catalyst. And I have a Tesla. I use the full self-driving. But 95% self-driving and 100%, you can drive a truck through that. So I think it's going to be a rough year for Tesla. So I would wait probably a couple quarters before I look to add to the position. You guys want to talk some CVS, United Health and Humana. You guys, Jim and Surratt, are attached at the hip on these stocks. <laughs> at least, at least as CVS and no, United no, Health I'm go. In a bad mood. You should be because I mean, United Health is one of the biggest drags, if not the biggest, at least for the Dow. I think that alone has got a couple hundred points peeled yes. off of, of the average. What do you want to? What do you want to do with this? I'm this is related to Medicare and. Um, Medicaid services and their rates. Yeah, I mean, the companies haven't come out yet to say how much is going to affect them because it is still a small piece of it. But the overall sentiment is so negative on these stocks. So as a long-term value investor, it's hard for me to sell at this point, but it is definitely in the reassessment camp. Okay. Um, for just United Health, what about CVS? Both. both. And, and, and CVS... Reassessment? CVS is, is an operational assessment in the sense that it was a turnaround story that they were going to actually get better margins on how their business is run. United Health is a very well-run business. The question is, how much is this going to affect their earnings going forward? You talk, are you telling me you're reassessing the place of both of these stocks in yes. your book? Yes. That's what you said. Okay. What about you? I'm not going to sell. Okay. Uh -huh. And it's not me being stubborn. And I know sometimes I have a stubborn streak, folks. <laughs> I do the numbers. You know how I do this. Okay. The health insurance business of CVS, I'm just going to focus on that, is one third of their operating income. Within that, 40% is Medicare. So you can do the math. We're talking about 12, 15% of their operating income is Medicare, where the payments from the government are going to be 1%. Let me say that again 1% less than expected. Okay. That does not merit, when you do the math, that does not merit a 9% decline. However, to Surratt's point, the sentiment on these stocks is terrible. It's a shoot first, ask questions later uh, type of environment. That is not the sort of thing I'm going to sell into. The company will report earnings in two and a half weeks. I will look to hear what they say then. And you know what I expect them to say, Surratt, is they're going to cut costs and they're going to deny a lot of claims because that's what insurance companies do. You're not, you're not tired of CVS? I am tired of it, Scott. Not that's why anything. I'm like, my dentist is tired of it because I'm yeah. gritting my teeth so much. So, you know, yes, I'm, I'm tired, tired of, of it. asking you about it. I'm, I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, because, I, you know, look, I mean, I could do this analysis like I just did, folks, all day long, and I can tell you to buy, and the stock market doesn't, dis doesn't agree with me, and sometimes that happens, and it's incredibly frustrating. Maybe sometimes the stock market wins, right? Yeah. What's up? Want, anything else? <laughs> no. Pippa Stevens has that. Welcome back. We do have some breaking news uh, regarding a deal, and a very interesting one at that, one that David Faber has been reporting on this whole time. Now we uh, have some finality, I think, David, right? We do. Uh, Endeavor, of course, uh, the large multifaceted firm, uh, of course, with its uh, control ownership of TKO, the combination of UFC, which you know well, Scott and uh, and World Wrestling uh, is going to be going private. Now, this is not a surprise, except in the timing, because, frankly, many investors in Endeavor had anticipated that the company would, in fact, be taken private some time back by its control shareholder, Silver Lake, the large private equity firm, which said it was looking at doing a deal many months ago. Uh, in, in the intervening time, the stock has sort of traded in a range, let's call it in the 20s or so, originally an expectation had been and a hope had been that perhaps a go private price would be 30 or more. That is not the case. 2750 a share in cash. That still says they say represents a 55 percent premium to the unaffected price of 1772. That was back in late October again when there was frustration on the part of uh, Endeavor's management led by Ari Emanuel and Mark Shapiro at the share price that then 
uh, was soon followed by at least the talk of a potential take private by uh, Silver Lake and some language to that effect. But Scott, we've been waiting for quite some time for the actual deal. There was a question about, well, is the financing taking longer? It's a large equity check given the 13 plus billion dollars in equity value we're talking about here. Uh, and so Silver Lake uh, seemingly took its time to line up the appropriate investors to back the equity side of the transaction, including, of course, the debt side. You also will be seeing here the rolling in of uh, ownership stakes of Mr. Emanuel and Mr. Shapiro as well. I'm checking some of the language here to make sure that is uh, still the case, but I'm, I'm fairly certain that, uh, in fact, it is. Uh, and, you know, we'll have to wait and see how happy or not shareholders are. Yeah, it's halted right now, in so terms we'll, of we'll the, get a quick look when it opens. Exactly. In terms of the performance of the special committee here, which obviously negotiated on their behalf, kind of a tricky situation where you, when you're negotiating, when your CEO and your president are rolling in to a deal and so potentially want a low price because that's where they get marked. And at the same time, obviously, your control shareholder is the only one that can make an offer for you. It's not like there have, could have been other offers potentially made here mm -hmm. if Silver Lake was unwilling as it was to sell its own stake. All right. Can I pivot you while I have you to Disney? Sure. Uh, since that's coming to a head. And, um, you know, the reports, including your own, would suggest there's a reasonably high level of Disney confidence, should I say, in the outcome, though that could obviously change. But what do we know now? Yeah, I mean, we're still waiting uh, for, obviously, the final tally. We should know something perhaps as soon as tomorrow morning, even though the uh, annual meeting won't start until 1 o'clock Eastern time. Scott, from what I'm hearing right now, and again, I always want to caveat that, it does appear that Disney is certainly in a very good position to prevail here. Uh, are they going to do so on some sort of crazy ratio of 70-30? No way. When you had ISS, the influential proxy advisory firm, go in favor at least of Nelson Peltz joining the board, that already made it much closer perhaps than might have been anticipated. But will they get something into the high 50s in terms of an overall percentage of votes in their favor? I think that is a possibility right now from what I'm hearing. Again, we are still waiting to hear from, at least officially, from some of the larger firms. But again, uh, Scott, from what I'm hearing right now, it does appear that Disney is likely to prevail and Mr. Peltz and Mr. Rizzullo will not be joining the company's board. Does that said, Votes can change right up until the last minute. Mm -hmm. We want to make sure that that is uh, part of anything we're sure to sharing. Does the closeness of the vote in the end matter at all to what transpires next in, in, in terms of the way that, you know, Bob Iger leads this company forward? If it's much closer than we thought, if it's just a hair win, does that matter? You know, if it's just a hair, it might matter in the sense of they certainly would have to think, well, we had an awful lot of shareholders who were unhappy in certain areas. That said, I'm not sure that that's going to be the case. Uh, and given the emotion on both sides here, um, I don't really think that Disney, regardless, as long as it prevails, would do anything differently than it is. They've said that they are very much focused on succession, which has certainly been a key point that Mr. Peltz has been making, something that the Disney board, he says, and many argue, uh, agree with him, failed at the last time around. Um, on execution, they say we're doing it. On cost cuts, we're doing it. So the argument has been, yeah, everything you say you want us to do, we're doing. Why do we need you? And it would appear, at least at this point, that Disney is a position to prevail in that, in that uh, point of view. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've got a, a couple of shareholders here. Um, Jim, you've said you're on Team Pelts, but even if he loses, you're not selling. Yeah, I think that's the clearest point I want to make, is I'm definitely not selling if Pelts doesn't get on. My feeling about it is that he can't hurt. Um, you know, just to what you were saying, I think if it turns out that uh, Disney prevails, I don't think there will be an olive branch extended by Mr. Iger to Mr. Pelts. Um, just seems like there's been too much blood spilt on this. But, you know, for guys like Surratt and me, we go to the operations. Yeah. And I keep saying this, you know, if we're really six months away or less from profitability in Disney+, Plus, this is where the future of the business lies, okay? This is what we're replaces linear television, which is obviously going away. Once you reach profitability, then you're having discussions like you're having about Netflix. How profitable. And that's a very positive place to be in with high gross margins. That's where I want to get to. That's where Mr. Iger wants to get to. That's why I wouldn't sell if Mr. Peltz doesn't and, prevail. And, and to add to that one, if you look at all the stuff we were talking about, oh, economy stronger than we expected. Well, that means it's good for Disney. It's good for theme parks. It's good for their businesses. And that's why you want to own the stock. Things are going in their favor. The economy stays stronger. The sum of the parts is so much greater than the whole. And to adding to what you said, the operating leverage that you get from streaming, 
you get actually a real multiple and you're going to get a discounted multiple. And David, as you know, I mean, one of the, the greatest assets, so to speak, that, that Iger has in his pocket here is a stock price that's gone steadily higher yes. over the course of the last many months, which helps his case tremendously. Right. I mean, the last quarter in particular, and given the stock's reaction so positive to that last quarter when they had far less in terms of losses on streaming than was anticipated, talked about it becoming profitable by what perhaps the September quarter or so of this year. Uh, Scott, that helped them a lot. Obviously, Mr. Pell says, yeah, that's because we've been no, pressuring course, them. You could spin and two Disney, sides every story. And of course, Disney says, no, that's not the case. We're just following the plan that we outlined more than a year yeah, ago. Maybe a little bit of both uh, as some things work out. Dave, thanks. Sure. Uh, David Faber, I appreciate you reporting on the Endeavor uh, deal, obviously, and then your insight on, on Disney. Coming Senior up, markets commentator Santoli. Mike Santoli joining us now here at the desk with his midday word. And the discomfort level of some of the bulls is going to be tested a little bit, and maybe yeah. that's not such a bad thing here. Ultimately, yes, could be a good thing. First of all, you don't get some of the silly stuff that was starting to roll really get out of hand and make some, uh, you know, instability kind of filter through the rest of the tape. And, yeah, the bond market is kind of, you know, making uh, making the bulls move their feet a little bit in the batter's box. I think that all is to the good. I, I do think we have to see if this thing is, is bought before we get to a 2% pull back again. Uh, that would show you the character of the market has changed. The low in the S&P this morning was right at the 20 day average. That's mm. been this trend line. It's been really tight. Hasn't been violated all year. So, you know, I think the tolerances are pretty small for, for this remaining a just a nick. Uh, I, I know I felt like a spoil sport saying, look, it's kind of overbought. We, you know, just because the market's broad and, and the rally has been more inclusive, it's not some inoculation against the regular pullback. So we'll see if we get that. Yeah, I mean, look, what, what I, I can't remember the exact stat that I read earlier in the program from Bespoke talking yeah. about the number of overbought closes that yeah. you've had for the S&P, right. the most in something like, you know, 20 some odd years. So and the forward it, implications of that are not they're just kind of like nothing special. No, it's just, yeah. oh, oh, wow. OK, I didn't, didn't realize meaning, it. Meaning it's not like and the market barrels higher or the market crashes. Yeah. It's just kind of like you got to sort it out. No, but you, you know, all it takes in these instances is a little thing sometimes yeah. of a rate backup to push you over the edge for that moment. Right, because a, few because a lot of things had come into the sweet spot of what we wanted, you know, in terms of macro data and the market performance and the rotation and the tape. So it could continue. We'll see. But, uh, you know, it's a slight test at this All right, point. I'll see you on closing, Bill. What do you want to do with uh, Roblox, for example, down 11 yep. percent in the quarter, uh, BHP down 15? So Roblox has been trading between 30 and 40 very consistently. So if you're a trader, but wait till it goes to 30, sell it at 40. I don't think Roblox is going to get meaningfully over 40 until their earnings positive or they get bought out. And so we'll see what happens when it gets above 40, what I do. I think it's a long-term winner if they can go earnings positive. Surat, I look at your American Tower down about 10% in the quarter. I, I've told you're buying more. You're I, adding to that? I like how you go to like the, my loser. You don't even go to any of my winners. Well, because it's actually actionable because you're actually yes, adding it to it. it is actionable. It is. I am right? adding to it. I think given where they are, if you look at the secular growth in towers, this is the place you want to be. They are down for the year because of the interest rate trade. But I think the business itself is so strong that even if rates don't come back down, you can make money. In the you stock. want some Uber love? It's up 32 percent. Meta's up 40. XPO's up 44. 44. So Uber and Meta, you know, I've been trimming this 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 quarter, just taking uh, money off the table. XPO is now also starting to trim. It's just had such a great run. Uh, so just deploying it into things like American Tower, Raytheon, which was a new buy also for us. So looking at other areas that we're, we're buying. Now. All right, good um, stuff. Brent Talkington, final trade. Uh, URNM, uranium. We all know uranium is the cleanest energy. China's all in. Saudi's all in. And I think that after a strong 2023, we're set up to have a strong 2024. Short-term technicals positive. Long-term fundamentals positive. Uh, okay. Sorry. Josh Brown. Uh, IEO, the breakout is real. All of these stocks were set up for higher highs. Yeah, oil's running again. Farmer Jim. On that note, Transocean finally got that plus $500,000 a day rig contract. All uh, right. Thank you. Surat Sethi. Same uh, agenda there. Um, SLB. Love wow. the oil services play. All right. Hello and welcome to Blue Cloud Trading. My name is George. In this uh, section of the video, we're going to take a quick look at the stocks, some of the stocks that were discussed, not all of them, on the show. And that was Josh Brown giving his opinion. I agree with Josh. I think this is uh, just part of the market. I mean, this is where you can expect when you have an uptrend. You're going to have these down days. 
Uh, right now, for example, you're looking at the Dow Jones. Yeah, it's down 1.11% as we speak. It's currently 2.28 p.m. as I'm recording this on April 2nd. And so the, we don't have a closing, time, you know, closing candle yet. This is still in effect. So we're going to look through the indices. We're going to look at a bunch of stocks that you see here listed on the left. We're going to take a look at the sectors as well and see how they're performing today, along with gold, silver, Bitcoin, and the VIX, which can help us get a better sense of um, the volatility of the markets. But why don't we first do this? Let's take a look at the indices right now as we speak. Like I said, it's you know almost 2.30 p.m. The Dow's down 1.14%. You know, it found some support in this area here. So that's a positive. NASDAQ is down 1.11%. Same thing. It's starting to actually uptick, as you can see, from its actual lows back in ten, at 10 a.m. The S&P 500, also sort of flat, but it's a little bit higher than its lows at 10. The Russell 2000 has dropped more. And... So I'm a little bit more concerned about the Russell, but as I'll show you in the charts, we are still not in very bad in a bad situation. The Russell was down 2.1%. Let's look at the heat map here, and you can see that all the semiconductors are down. You can see the percentages there. Microsoft is down, along with those companies. Apple, Google's down a little bit. Tesla down 5.26%. The energy stocks are doing really well. Oil and gas doing well. Healthcare plans down a lot today, as you can see. So let's uh, get started with the charts, and uh, we'll start off with the Dow. And this is the weekly chart we're looking at. So as you can see, we're still in an established uptrend. Uh, we don't have a break or close under the Tankinson, and we won't know until Friday, actually. Uh, so, you know. There's really no significance for me to be showing you the weekly charts um, during the week. Friday is the day that I tend to do more on the weekly charts. So let's get into the dailies here. The Dow, and we're using the Ichimoku indicator for those of you who are new to the site. And um, this really helps us quickly assess the situation. You know, we want to see price, for example, above the two moving averages, the Tenkinson, which is the, not, the last nine periods, highs and lows divided by two. And the Kijinsen, the highs and lows of the last 26 periods divided by two. And then you have the Ichimoku cloud. You want price to be above that. Very easy to visually see where we are. We're in a very strong uptrend. Yes, we on the Dow uh, today, for example, and one more thing about this uh, indicator. You can see that this white line here, that's the closing prices in a line form projected 26 periods into the past. And the Ichimoku cloud actually projects 26 periods into the future, helping to give us an insight of what might transpire. And uh, for example, over here, you can see when we had a twist uh, 26 periods into the future, and then price back over here dropped. So it can give us a little bit of insight that there might be some trouble ahead. We don't see that yet. All right. Future is looking pretty bright still. But one thing that looks like it's happening on the daily chart and it's happened uh just once before right here uh on march 5th we had price close under the kijinsen and then the next day it, it popped back above it found support there so it's a very strong level of support dow has dropped 1.09 percent we may have a similar situation we may actually come back and find to our next support level that would be the cloud and that would be approximately 1.09% uh, away from this level, okay? And then uh, then the, so that's the synchrospan A, synchrospan B, the lower part of the cloud. So both of these lines will be levels of support. All right, let's continue here. Uh, on the daily, Russell 2000 has closed under the, the Kijinsen. Um, and uh, it was finding some resistance here at 212.25. That's based on a weekly chart. Okay, if we go back in time based on this candle, uh, back on April 8th of 2022, around the same time, uh, so two years ago. <laughs> so since that time, it found resistance here, and it's dropped a little bit. Now, we are in an uptrend right now. We're technically in an uptrend on the weekly chart. We have, in fact, established um, some, let me just fix something here. Yeah, we've, we've established uh, higher highs and higher lows. 
this high, for example, here, right? Let me just uh, point it with the uh, arrow. Right there, that high is higher than this one. This low is higher than this low. So that's what we want to see. This is an imaginary, uh, not a candle that I drew. This is what we need to see in order for the Russell to really take off, in my opinion. We need to get above 212.25. So I'd like to see a bullish candle like this one in the near future, hopefully. And once we get that, I think that will be the confirmation that we need from a technical perspective. And we won't know that again. Uh, I don't expect that to be happening this week. It may happen next week because you can see we're, we're down this week a little bit here so far. Um, so let's keep going, guys. Uh, the QQQs finding some support at the 433.78 level. They were down 109. This is uh, the weekly chart, the daily. We've also crossed under the Kijunson. That happened you know, prior here, March 15th, and then it bounced above it. Tenkinson is above the Kijunson. That's positive. It's, it's when we see this green line cross under that trouble can ensue because it could be the leading sort of letting us know, hey, things are, might be changing. The direction of the market might be changing. We also haven't taken out this prior low. All right, so I wouldn't be too concerned at this point. That's why I agree with Josh. Uh, the SPY doing well. It was uh, down 0.79%, but as you can see, the, the trend is still very strong. It's in between the Tankinson and Kijunson. Has been there many times before. Not a big deal. Okay, let's look at Apple. Apple not doing so good. It uh, is under the cloud on the daily chart. It's finding some support. Notice that level there. Let me just draw it in place so we can know the exact level. The low there of that candle is 168.49. And we'll change it to a light red color there so that we, we can distinguish the daily support levels from the blue ones that are the weekly levels. So we're finding support. That's good for Apple. Maybe we'll get a bounce tomorrow. Who knows? Uh, I personally am not invested in Apple because it's under the cloud. And one of the rules of the Ichimoku is you don't go, you're not entering long positions when price is under the cloud. Okay. The same thing applies here on the weekly chart with Apple. It's inside the cloud. You don't you also don't want to be entering a long position when price is inside the cloud. All right. Daily, there we have it. Okay, let's keep going. Amazon looking strong. I mean, uh, here's the daily chart. Yes, it's dropped, but look what's happening right now. It's moving up. Let's switch it from the daily to a shorter time frame, the three minute. So it gapped down this morning and Amazon is now, since um, approximately 9.45 a.m., if we measure this move, we're actually up 1.23%. It's only down 0.24. So Amazon's doing pretty good today. Let's look at this a little closer here, the daily chart. Yeah, I like this. See, so it's finding, it's it's come down to a very normal level, the Tankinson, that's where it's gonna find equilibrium. And now we can expect a bounce off of this level. This is a nice, uh, you know, potential buying opportunity. On the weekly chart, it's still forming, so I wouldn't be too worried about that one. Let's keep going. Now this Ka uh, Kava group, this was one of our subscribers requesting me to do uh, some analysis on this one. On the daily chart, it's in a strong uptrend. It has also crossed into the Tenkinson today. It was down 3.85%. Uh, I'd be, I'd start to get concerned if it gets under this low here. Uh, the low there is $60.70 because it will also coincide with the Kijunson, as you can see right there. So if we get a close under there, you know, you may want to re reduce your position, you know, take some, take some of your profits. Um, if you're a long-term investor, pay more attention to the weekly. So this, this would apply for the daily, would apply if you're an active trader. On the weekly, we are developing a bearish engulfing pattern, um, but this candle hasn't formed yet, so we really can't uh, you know, say that conclusively yet because it's only Tuesday. All right, we may, for example, get a bounce right now. This is a, a very positive candle today. All right, we got a spinning top, and it's bullish. It's a bullish spinning top because it's not red. And uh, let's see the three minute on that one. Yeah, so it's just kind of like stuck in a range. It doesn't look like it's really breaking down particularly. Here's another stock um, that was requested, Cisco Systems Inc. On the daily chart, not looking good. 
we have a lower high here than this high. And um, we don't have a lower low yet. Uh, this is the, the prior low here, and that one is higher than this one. So, but um, if you're an active trader, I would not be holding a position in this one because it's under the cloud on the weekly chart. It's inside the cloud. You know, you have your, this is the last level of support, for example, on the weekly, the, the cloud here. This low is what I'd be looking for, looking at specifically $47. Um, let's see, $47.66. If it breaks under there, you're in, going to be in a lot of trouble. If it closes, not just breaks and pierces, because you can get a piercing like this one right here. See that where it just continues to go down. Um, but if you get a closing candle down here under that level, I'd be concerned. Here's another one from our subscribers that was requested, uh, Fastenal Company. It's in the industrial sector. This one's down 0.31% today. It's very strong uptrend on the weekly. It's a, that's the weekly chart we're looking at. How about the daily? It's it's crossed under the Tenkinson and Keegan's. I'm sorry, under the Tenkinson. Uh, but the trend is intact still. So nothing to be concerned about yet. Google. Um, let's see. Google was not uh, requested, but I'm going to talk about it. Uh, let's see. Google broke above. This was yesterday. Broke above this level of 153.98, and but it's come back down under it. And it's interesting that it's finding resistance now at that specific level. All right, that level was drawn based on the weekly charts, um, and it was uh, this specific pivot candle here. Okay, let's keep going. IEO is the ETF that was brought up. I believe by Josh, he likes this one. Let's see that what it looks like on the weekly. It looks very strong on the weekly, I love this one. Uh, it broke through, Josh, are you watching my videos? Because <laughs> I've actually covered this one and I actually drew the, this, uh, let's see, when did I create that? That was on March 28th, oh, okay, that's very recent. And this was created on March 28th. I talked about this pivot candle, it popped above here, uh, let's see on uh, March 28th, and then it's it's continuing its way up. Let's see the daily chart. Daily is looking strong. We've, we're, you know, this specific sector is, is very strong right now. Oil and gas is doing well. My expectation is it's gonna continue to do well in the near future. We don't see any problems quite yet. We are getting a little bit far from the Tenkinson, but it's above, it's broke through a very important resistance level on the weekly, so, you know, if it does come back down, it's probably going to come back and find some support right there. Let's see. Let's keep going. Meta um, was also requested. Um, Meta is on the daily chart under the Tenkinson and Kijinson, and the Tenkinson has crossed under just barely. You can see it right there. A little bit concerning. The cloud is still very strong, um, but I don't like that. Now, here's a level I'd be really concerned of if you're a active trader, it's the 476 level. It's that low right there. Uh, because if it breaks through that, it will probably also drop down to the next level of 453, which is based on that candle. Okay, let's keep going. Microsoft, um, another stock that was requested. This one is looking great on the daily chart. It's just under the Tenkinson, you know, if we pop above the Tenkinson again and above this, uh, well, we now it looks like we have another new level of resistance here. So let's make that, let's draw that one. So the high there is 430.82. We can just type that in there. If you guys like this software, uh, there is a link down below and you can get a discount if you are a subscriber. So the perfect time to just uh, hit that subscribe button in the bottom right hand corner of your video. And don't forget to like as well. Okay, so let's see. Um, this is the target I'd be looking for, 430.82. If you're, you know, and it's it's about 2.26% away from where we are. Uh, I If you're looking to re-enter Microsoft, you want to wait until you get a closing price above that level. That's what I'd be looking at. Or at a, you could also alternatively take a long position if it gets above the Tenkinson. And just put a stop, you know, um, maybe under, let's see, where would I put a stop under this in this situation? If, if it continues going up, I'd probably put a stop right under the low of this candle. All right, let's keep going. NVIDIA. 
finding some support at the Cajunson. It's down 0.98% today. Um, nothing to be too concerned about on the daily. On the weekly chart, this is a pivot candle that uh, where it needs to, in my opinion, get above 974 before I would take a new long entry position. Unless it comes back further down, crosses under the tank and send, but you know, for a short period and then pops back above it, that would indicate that there's a uh, that there's the buyers are start, starting to step back in. All right, let's keep going. Here's another one, uh, Trans Ocean Rig. This one, I'm not sure. I think it may have been a subscriber that requested this. Um, profit margins negative, not good. Sales growth negative, not good. On the weekly chart, it's inside the cloud, not an optimal time to be entering a new long position. Uh, on the daily chart, it does look strong, um, but I wouldn't invest in this company because it's it has these negative uh, fundamentals. And when there's so many other companies out there with positive fundamentals, positive profit margins, why would you want to take the chance on, on a company that hasn't figured out how to become profitable yet? SCHD, Schwab, U.S. Dividend Equity. I believe this one was also a uh, subscriber. Um, this one's down 0.57%. Looks very strong on the daily chart, though. It's just, you know, finding support there on the Tankinson. On the weekly, you know, it hasn't formed yet. I'd stay in this one. SLB Energy. This was uh, talked about. I think someone purchased this or re recommended this maybe at the end of the video. I, I can't remember. Anyway, it's down 2.17%. I don't like the sales growth on this company. Not something I'd be interested in investing in. Tesla dropped 5.59%. It's very, you know, I had said that it was more than likely to drop, to continue dropping, especially once we got that pivot candle. See this, this, uh, let me just point to it there. This one right here. Notice what happened. It, uh, it's an inverse hammer, right? That's a reversal candle. It came right to the Kijinson, a level of resistance. And look what happened, it turned over. And it's continuing to turn over. Tesla's news have not been positive lately. Uranium, URNM, that was uh, by one of the guests on the show. She recommended this one. Let's see, on the daily chart, I like the fact that it just barely is, looks like it's breaking above the Ichimoku cloud. Let's now take a look at the weekly chart for Uranium. Looks very strong, actually. Um, it's in an uptrend. It's broken through some levels. Looks like I drew these a while back, though. That was created back on January 9th of 2024. You can see that when I hover my mouse there, and that little box pops open. So I've been following this one. I like it. I like what it looks like on the weekly. And um, it's, an, it's basically like a hedge against the market, too. So in a sense, it's not a bad area to consider entering we do have like i said a higher high here than this high a higher low here than this low after this decline so um it looks it looks really good i like what i like the fact that she recommended that all right um let's do this uh we have to take a quick look we're just going to go very quickly through these because i don't want this video to be super long and so we're just going to look at the daily charts on these and see how they're doing and what's looking strongest XLB down 0.54%, looking very strong, okay? Look at it, it's above the Tenkinson. XHB just crossed under the Tenkinson, still very strong, it was down 2.03. XLK has crossed under both moving averages, not as strong, but it's inside this, um, basically it's inside the uh, consolidation zone that I had talked about in the previous video, right? So it's in here, it's just kind of stuck. I think they're just waiting for a breakout in one direction or the other before we know um, conclusively which way technology is going to be moving. I'm more optimistic that it's going to be continuing up. XLY uh, has crossed under both moving averages, but you can see that the uh, elements of the Ichimoku are positive, except for, and here's something I don't talk about very often, unless I notice something interesting happening with it, the Chiku span, this white line, which is the closing prices in a line form, it got under price. You can see it right there. That's a little bit concerning. That can be the leading indicator of just giving you a, 
uh, a heads up, hey, things might be turning down. But uh, we also have a slope. If you take a look, let's see here. It's sloping down a little bit, that high there and there, those closing prices. It's just slight. It's not anything major, but it's a little bit concerning. This is the level here that I'd be very concerned about. If it gets under the Ichimoku cloud and this low, you're going to be, um, it's going to be breaking the uh, uptrend. And then we'll have a new downtrend because this high is higher than this one. Slightly. Okay, but it's 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 slightly higher, but it is higher. Okay, um, XLF finding support at the Tengensen. It looks like it's you know the day is not over yet. It is uh, two fifty p.m. as I'm recording this, so we still have another hour and ten minutes. We'll see if it gets above that level of forty one. What is that? Forty one seventy. Okay, let's keep going. Energy. This is the winner today, right? It's up 0.93%, looking very strong. Industrials down just 0.42%, still a very strong uptrend. Consumer staples finding some support at the Kijensen. We did have a couple of day, couple of days where it got under it back on February 13th and, and the 14th, but then it, it uh, took took off again. So I wouldn't be too worried about it yet. Um, let's see. Healthcare. This one is in uh, this... Um, Let's see here. There's a low right there that it's just closed under. See that low? This little box. Let me just draw it for you. All right there. See how it got under there. Now it's finding support at the at the cloud. Uh, there is also a weekly level of support at 143.42. Let's look at that one. All right. And that one is based on these candles. These candles here, that particular one, the high was 143.42. That was April 8th of 2022. So I'm still um, very, I, I feel there's nothing, until we get a break on a weekly chart under 143.42, I'd still be long uh, healthcare. If you're a long-term investor, uh, and um, if you're a uh, active trader, Keep an eye on that level. If it gets closes under there, you may want to take some profits at that point and exit the, the position. This would have been a good place to take some profits right here when it came back, created a reversal candle at the 148.20, which was a prior high, you know. So anyway, if you didn't get that chance, just give me an alternative option. Utilities is uh, on the daily chart looking good. It's moving up. We have higher highs, higher lows. How about the weekly, though? On the weekly, we don't. We have to get above this pivot candle of so that high is $66.70. So I'd hold off on utilities just for the time being. We also, um, yeah, it's it's you know it, it closed above the cloud, but on a negative candle. And then, like I said, we need to get some confirmation there. Uh, this is the BITO ETF. This one is down 5.58%. And uh, let's see that this is the weekly chart. It's been kind of stuck in this little range here. Let's look at the daily to get more insight on what's happening. So on the daily chart, this pivot candle right here, what's the low of that one? Low is 27.44. So let's draw that in. Change color. This is a daily support level. This is what I'd be mostly concerned about, this 27.44 level. Um, I mean, we do, in fact, right now we're developing a lower, we do have a lower high right there. You can see that slope that's happened. And so this is the level I'd be really concerned about the most on this ETF. Okay, let's keep going. UUP US dollar down 0.11. So that's positive actually for the market. That's what we want to see. I mentioned in the prior video, you guys check out the prior video. I said the US dollar is going to give us some insight of what is going to happen with the markets. If it breaks through, now this is, we're going to go to switch it to the weekly. I said it was going to find some resistance here at the Kijensen, and it is finding resistance. See how, how the, ten, the sellers came in right there on that wick? Here's the five minute chart right there. It's got, it's starting to 
find some resistance there. Um, it could, you know, if it is, as long as we don't break above the Kijunsen and close above it on a weekly candle, I think the market is still strong and still, you know, intact. This can be a predictor. And when the US dollar starts strengthening, it tends to weaken the market. And, uh, and although it's been happening a little bit here um, uh, on the weekly, but it's still under the cloud and on the daily, I feel like it's probably going to start stalling here at this point, and it's probably going to draw back down. We'll see. Nobody can predict the markets, but the, the good news is we have technicals to help us assess the situation right now in this particular moment, what's happening, so we can get a better idea. Remember, the technicals are going to take all of the data collectively, right, that's out there, the news, the earnings announcements, all that, and it's going to project it in a visual manner for us to quickly assess what is happening based on where price was, where it is now, and we can, from that, determine what direction we are currently in. And we want to be on the right side, not on the wrong side. This is the VIX, the volatility um, index. And this basically shows us the fear in the markets. It's up 7.99% today. But look, these numbers are very low. 14.74 is very low. This is the weekly chart. The daily chart, it's uh, finding it found some some resistance here at the cloud and, draw, and drew back down. So that's good. Let's hope it uh, continues to drop. Okay, real estate on the daily chart is inside the cloud. I don't let, you know, I've mentioned uh, this one's in a down slope right now. We have a lower high, and that, so I wouldn't be interested in entering real estate at this moment based on that. See that down slope there? And not only that, there's also this down slope here. So what that means is there might be some acceleration taking place when you get a lower high here from this high. And if we break now, this is the level I'd be watching right here. If you get under that level, it could be trouble because now you're going to have a lower low. And that will be the definition of a downtrend on the daily. So that's for active traders. Does the same thing apply for the weekly? And um, the answer is no, because we are above the cloud. All right, we have a higher high here than this high. We have a higher low here than this low. But on the daily, in the short term, I wouldn't be entering real estate. It doesn't seem like the opportune time. That's all. Gold strengthened today. It, it I drew this last uh, yesterday. I drew this yesterday because it's a reversal candle. I said if price got under the low of that candle, which was 206.29, it was more than likely to drop. It, that didn't happen. It got canceled out. That's good news. We can remove that now. So gold is still strong. When there's weakness in the markets, gold tends to do well. And it's a good hedge for those of you who are a little bit more concerned about a downturn that's likely to take place in the near future based on some comments that Tom Lee mentioned in a prior video. He Tom Lee did say that we should have a a pullback, you know, in the first half of the year, in the first six months of the year. You know, we haven't reached June yet. You know, I know people have been wondering, where's this pullback? You know, we might get it soon. Who knows? Nobody can really predict the market. Nobody. But his prediction has not faltered quite yet. You know, we'll know in June where we're at. Silver, looking strong today. Looking very strong today. It broke through this level right here, that high of um, 23.45. And now it's probably going to find resistance over here. What is that price? That level is 23.94. And we'll change the color here. So would I be entering a long position? Not until it gets above that level. Um, and we'll find some more resistance over here too. I like gold more than I do silver as far as the technicals go. And then Bitcoin, the price is, uh, you can see here, 65684 This is the BTC slash USD. Um, 
and uh, we still have a Tenkinson above the Kijinson here, but price has closed under both moving averages, or it looks like it's going to. Hasn't yet. And that, my friends, will finish and end this video. And it was a long one. But on a day like this, I think it's uh, important to try to share, you know, with you guys my thoughts on what's happening. If you guys are finding some value in these videos and want to support this channel so I can keep on bringing these videos to you and more of them in the future, the best way to do it is to hit the like button and to subscribe. And I really appreciate it. We have reached over 7,100 subscribers. So let's keep it going. Let's hit that 8,000 mark. Okay? Catch you all in the next one.